Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Meet the Expert event. My name is Desiree, and I'm with Buena Vista Museum. We're here today with Ray McNeish. Today she, will, she, today, she will be talking about plastic pollution in the environment. Dr. McNeish received her Bachelor of Science degree in biology from Millersville University of Pennsylvania, where she studied how an invasive plant, the tree of heaven, and an invasive crayfish, the rusty crayfish, impacted the aggressive behavior of the native crayfish species. Dr. McNeish is currently an assistant professor in the Department of Biology at Cal State University of Bakersfield. She earned her master's of science and PhD degrees in biology from the University of Dayton, Ohio, while she explored how management activities for the removal of terrestri terrestrial invasive um, plant, the Amur honeysuckle, impacted stream ecosystems. Dr. McNeish conducted her postdoctoral research at the Loyola University, Chicago of Illinois, with the goal of understanding how seasonal patterns and changes in the landscape impact microplastic pollution in rivers throughout Lake Michigan watershed. Uh, some interesting facts about Ms. McNeish. Uh, she's an amateur plant taxonomist, a birder, a photographer, and a fabric dyer. Now, before we get started, I'd like to let you know that if you like today's event and you would like to see more content like this from Buena Vista Museum, then I would invite you all to make a donation. You can make a donation to the museum anytime at buenavistamuseum.org slash donate. Now, before we get started, I'd like to let you know, oh, sorry about that. <laughs> Oh, also, if you would be so kind to keep your devices muted, and if you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the chat window below. There should be a chat button on your screen. Go ahead and click it, and we'll get to those questions as we proceed. Now, without further ado, I would like to welcome Ray McNeish. Hello, everyone. Um, <laughs> sorry if you heard that. I'm in my office, so hopefully the phone doesn't ring again. I can't control that. Um, so today I'm gonna to share with you basically my part of my research journey with plastic pollution and anthropogenic litter in the environment. Um, so basically we're gonna talk a lot about trash today and how human activities and environmental conditions influence um, the abundance distribution and fate of anthropogenic litter in the environment. So to start off with, I would like to uh, scale out at a picture of planet Earth. And oftentimes when you look at a picture of Earth, you immediately notice that there's a lot of blue on the planet, right? Uh, and so sometimes Earth is referred to as a water planet uh, because the blue represents uh, the coverage of water. A lot of times when I talk about water abundance on the planet with students in my class, they're always really surprised to learn that there's really not that much fresh water present on planet Earth relative to the size of the planet. And so this is actually um, a photo from uh, this paper here um, from 1993. And also you can get this on the USGS uh, government website. So this is uh, all of planet Earth right here. And if you were to collect all of the water on the planet and put it into a sphere and relative size comparison, this is uh, how much uh, water in terms of volume relative to planet we have on uh, planet Earth. Less than 4% is the form of freshwater, which is the form that tr most terrestrial animals, including humans, need to survive. And this little itty bitty blue dot right there represents all the rivers and uh, lakes, okay? And that makes up less than a third of percent of the freshwater on planet Earth. So freshwater is a really rare and precious resource. And uh, as a freshwater ecologist, I'm always surprised by how degraded you know, all of the freshwater habitats are that I come across. So just for some examples, this is a satellite image back in 2011 of uh, Lake Erie, one of the Great Lakes of, uh, Laurentian Great Lakes of North America. And that uh, bright green you see in the lake, that's a harmful algal bloom. Uh, and so some species of algae, when the bloom gets big enough, can produce toxins, which can really have a, a negative impact on human health and also wildlife health. Sometimes our drinking water sources also are polluted. If there's excess nitrate uh, within drinking water and uh, you drink enough of it, 
Uh, nitrate can um, result in deoxygenization of the blood, so your blood doesn't get enough oxygen. If you're a small child, um, your skin is going to turn a tinge of blue. So this is uh, methemoglobinemia and commonly referred to as the blue baby syndrome. There's a lot of um, different types of other pollutants that are entering the environment. Um, so of course, there's anthropogenic litter, uh, human trash, a lot of nutrients, um, excess. Um, if our problem with our sometimes our stormwater systems might be um, picking up uh, some pollutants, maybe there's some oil leaking from a car, uh, and then stormwater picks that up and it gets dumped into a river. Okay, uh, this orange one here, so I'm not sure how familiar folks are. Um, I'm not from California, but I'm from the Northeast uh, coal country, uh, lots of mines. And so we get these acid mine drainage streams. Uh, the water uh, pH is quite low and acidic. I have almost never seen anything living in these streams. Uh, and they uh, smell <laughs> quite strong as sulfur, rotten eggs. And uh, something a bit more familiar, I think, uh, with folks in uh, California is water diversion. So here, this is a photo I took of a river on uh, Maui, one of the islands of Hawaii. And you just go uh, further down um, river, just a couple miles to town. Uh, and you see that the water level is really quite low. A lot of times folks think, or think there's a dam upstream, but it's actually a series of grates and diversions diverting water from the wet side, the lush green tropical wet side of the island to the dry side of the island. And the dry side of the islands look a lot like the Central Valley of California uh, whenever I go back to Hawaii. And so for today's um, talk, I'm gonna share uh, some of the uh, research journey uh, with you guys on anthropogenic litter and plastic pollution in the environment. So what I would like to do uh, first off is again, scale back out to planet Earth. When you think about anthropogenic litter and debris, a lot of times folks are thinking about, you know, what you see in National Geographic photos and in the news, right? Um, uh, marine animals, which that is of course where we see a lot of anthropogenic litter accumulate is in the oceans. But there's also a lot of quote, space anthropogenic litter debris as well. Um, some of it is um, in being used and it's not really uh, debris per se, but there's a lot of other space material just surrounding our planet. So anthropogenic litter, this is basically human trash, okay? Uh, it's man-made. Uh, plastic is the most abundant material type, but this also includes other materials like glass, processed wood, metals, okay, um, textiles, even if they're natural based like a, a cotton, it's still an anthropogenic uh, ma uh, material. Uh, and we break anthropogenic litter into different size classes. Um, for the purpose of this first part here of our talk today, um, anything greater than five millimeters um, is gonna fall into the macro and meser litter debris. So five millimeters, that would be, for example, about maybe half the width of my pinky nail, okay? And so we find anthropogenic litter, not just of course in space around the planet, but we also find it on the beaches, okay? This is a beach in Norway. Uh, it is in the deserts, okay? And actually camels are eating, or excuse me, drinking, if you will, lots of plastic bags. So uh, this is actually uh, kind of like a calcified plastic bag because um, when they're slurping up water, um, it's really easy for plastic bags that are in the water for them to also go down the hatch, if you will. And as I said before, um, litter will accumulate in the oceans. And so we have the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. Okay, uh, it's estimated to have 1.8 uh, trillion plastic pieces uh, floating in the patch. And it is the largest one, okay, between uh, Hawaii and uh, the state of California. This is a sample here by Captain Moore, who actually is the person who discovered uh, the Pacific garbage patch while he was sailing one day. Okay, so there's quite a diversity of anthropogenic materials. Okay, and so just for size, it's um, bigger than twice the size, the state of Texas, or three times the size of the country of France. So it's really quite large. I'll kind of go back there and you can kind of see, so here's San Francisco, here's Hawaii, and it covers this here, okay? 
And so it's the Great Pacific, North Pacific Garbage Patch, okay? There's actually five garbage patches in the ocean um, because there's five oceanic gyres, which are linked to atmospheric currents, excuse me, currents, and also uh, the ocean currents as well. And so we do get these five garbage patches. Now, plastics in the ocean uh, sources, 20% uh, actually come from ocean-based sources like marine vessels, uh, fishing lines, and nets. But most of the plastics and other debris that ends up in the ocean is actually from land-based sources. Uh, so tourism or maybe stormwater picks up um, some trash and it uh, drains into a river and the river is connected to the ocean. Okay, so freshwater rivers are really important uh, for the movement of materials within continents inland to the oceans, whether that be organisms, um, natural organic uh, debris like wood or tree leaves or anthropogenic litter. Okay, and so Speaking of streams, so I uh, spent uh, quite a bit of time studying rivers and lakes, uh, and every single site I go to, um, I always find anthropogenic litter, either hanging out in the riparian or streamside area, okay, and some of these sites are in uh, really, you know, nice and remote uh, state forest parks, Okay, some of them are these little stormwater outfalls. So rain, stormwater comes out through here and then a lot of trash will build up right there. Okay, this image uh, represents a study uh, done by Geyer and others in 2017, uh, where they calculated the total amount of plastic produced, okay, since the 1950s, uh, which is about 8,300 million metric tons. Of the total amount of practice uh, excuse me, plastic produced, most of it has in the landfill or has been discarded into the environment. Okay, only about 6% has actually made it into the recycling system with most of what's been recycled ending up discarded eventually. Okay, and so about 90% of all plastics that have ever been produced still exist somewhere in some form today. Okay. And so this is another figure from that paper. Um, the red line here is present because this uh, represents about uh, 2015, okay? Uh, and so here you can see the plastic production uh, waste, okay, that's been discarded, incinerated, recycled, and just overall generated the black line here. And the dotted lines here are in the future. And so you can see that plastic growth has been an exponential historically and is continued, expected to continue to be so. So we can expect that more and more debris is going to accumulate in the environment, okay, as we move towards the future. Okay, so this really shows us, okay, not just the future, but the studies that have been happening globally is that anthropogenic litter is accumulating and it's a global pervasive issue. It's increasing and essentially permanent. Anthropogenic litter has been part of the environment for decades. One uh, aspect of anthropogenic uh, litter, so we talked about uh, meso and macro being greater than five millimeters, a um, uh, size class that folks may have heard in the news or maybe come across some other articles is microplastics, okay? And so microplastics are um, less than five millimeters, okay, along the longest length, okay? So again, that's roughly probably about half the width, at least of my pinky nail here, okay? And so microplastics have been found um, in drinking water sources all across the globe. Uh, there was a study in, that looked at 24 German beers and uh, found microplastics on uh, two to 79 particles per liter of beer. Okay, we find microplastics in table salt, okay? And I have found microplastics in every single faucet I have ever sampled, including research labs uh, with different grades of water. Okay, microplastics have also been found in Arctic and quite remote locations throughout the planet, and it's also in the air. Okay, so it's in the air that we breathe, it's part of the dust. And so folks are oftentimes asking me, what are the human implications? I don't really study the human implications. Um, 
but it is a very interesting uh, topic to ask. So I added this slide here in case folks were really interested about this. Okay, we eat, drink, and breathe microplastics all the time. <laughs> I'm convinced it's all the time. Okay, uh, we it's in our drinking water. Okay, when you're consuming your food, you're consuming microplastics. Okay, and so it's average uh, estimate is about 1700 uh, particles potentially uh, per week just from drinking water. Okay. And uh, just a few weeks ago, right, uh, I'm not sure if folks heard in the news that there was a paper published. I'm still working my way through that paper, um, reading it, but they found essentially they say microplastics, but the size class is really a nanoparticle size, um, quite small plastic particles in blood for the first time. Uh, and so the health implications for microplastics is a very understudied area. Okay, for many years, folks were just kind of studying where is it and how much in the environment. And I would argue it really wasn't until maybe the past decade where folks started doing studies uh, more consistently on invertebrates, uh, toxic potential effects. And uh, more recently, a lot of these questions are gearing towards human health impacts, but more research is needed. In terms of ecological studies, that um, area has been growing quite a bit. We know plastics are used by microbes. They will hitchhike on them, example, through a wastewater treatment plant. Uh, terrestrial biota, so terrestrial organisms will interact with plastics, either consumption or maybe using plastics to build their nests. And in aquatic organisms, we see that microplastics are either intentionally or incidentally um, being ingested uh, by organisms. And so this is a map, it's a litter-based map, uh, and the circles represent uh, where studies were conducted on the planet for anthropogenic litter, and the purple represents the plastic, and the bigger the circle, the more that was found. What I want you to notice in this slide is that most of these studies are happening in the marine or coastal habitats, with very few studies happening inland, okay, which is interesting because as you saw before, about 80% of what ends up in the ocean is coming from terrestrial sources, okay? This is another litter-based map that is um, showing the point study locations for um, that we're studying interactions with organisms, okay? Whether it's ingestion, entanglement, or whatnot, but we see the same patterns. Um, most of the research is happening in the marine or coastal habitats with very little uh, attention giving to inland uh, habitats, okay? And so this actually opens the door for a lot of collaborative and research opportunities, especially for someone like me, who's a freshwater ecologist and spends a lot of time studying inland rivers and lakes and ponds. And so the overarching question uh, for this area of my research is really to understand what terrestrial aquatic connections uh, influence the transport and fate of plastic pollution in the environment. So we can understand these connections from a scientific perspective, but also be able to inform policy and managers uh, that are trying to manage the issue of plastic pollution and anthropogenic litter debris in the environment. So I use this phrase, terrestrial aquatic linkages, okay? And so when we look at a photo of the landscape, the landscape is a mosaic of different patches of land use and land cover. We have forest patches, agricultural patches, we've got urban and rural patches, and of course we have patches and sections that are of water. Rivers, and the surrounding terrestrial landscape are interconnected. They share resources, okay? So for example, if you have a highly woody vegetated stream, it's gonna block sunlight, reduce the amount of light that's available for algal growth, and the water is gonna be colder, okay? If you have a lot of uh, diversity of vegetation along your stream, you're gonna have a diversity of plant material falling into that stream, like woody debris, different types of leaves that can serve as food or habitat for aquatic organisms, okay? 
And so the plant vegetation uh, in the streamside area, that's called the riparian zone. It's the area right there adjacent, uh, adjacent to the stream. If there's lots of vegetation, that vegetation can help mediate different types of pollution, like nutrient pollution, reduce sedimentation and erosion. Uh, if uh, there's not much vegetation or not complex, uh, maybe it's just all grass, uh, then the ability to mediate pollutants is going to uh, generally decrease. And because of human activities, the landscape overall is disturbed. And this can influence these terrestrial to aquatic, and it goes the other way, aquatic to terrestrial. So you have a lot of resources leave your stream and go to the terrestrial environment. So for example, aquatic insects uh, that might be juvenile in uh, our aquatic juveniles, but metamorphosed into terrestrial adults. Think like damselflies, dragonflies, and mosquitoes, for example. And so what about anthropogenic pollutants? Okay, um, so this could be chemical pollutants, pharmaceuticals, okay, or in my case, plastic pollution, anthropogenic litter. So the research I'm going to share with you today, give you um, a peek through in some of our projects, is really kind of focused on understanding these terrestrial aquatic connections so we can understand how anthropogenic activities are linked to pollution in the environment, changes in landscape features, atmospheric conditions, and also interactions with aquatic uh, and terrestrial animals. Okay, so those are really bigger, uh, you know, facets of the overall themes of the projects. And so what I'm gonna do for the rest of the presentation is really kind of take you on the plastic journey of research and anthropogenic litter um, questions and how they developed over time, uh, ending with uh, local research that we're doing here at CSUV. And so what you see here um, is Lake Michigan. This is one of the Laurentian Great Lakes of North America. This big red blob right here is Chicago. That's where I was before I came here. Uh, and so as a postdoctoral researcher, so I was just doing research after finishing my PhD, uh, we were studying microplastics in major river tributaries around the Lake Michigan that drain into the lake to see, you know, what sort of riverine features are influencing the transport of microplastics into the lake. So we collected water samples, uh, benthic sediment, so sediment at the bottom of the rivers, okay, and organisms like fish, macroinvertebrates, and microbes. Just to kind of uh, give you an idea of how we process our samples, okay, uh, for water samples here, um, some, if they're very clean, we just do a vacuum filtration and the particulates end up on a filter, and then we look at them under a microscope to determine uh, how many microplastics there are. For more complicated samples like sediment or fish tissues, if we dissect out the digestive tract, we have to dissolve or digest as much of the organic materials we can, physically clean up the samples, uh, and also do a separation, uh, density separation, where the plastics float out of the sediment, for example, and we can drain off the sediment. And then filter um, the liquid with the plastics. So this is a filter actually from a red goby fish, uh, and there's a red microplastic fiber in this circle right here. So this actually generates uh, literally thousands of filters uh, and it requires a very large team of undergrads uh, to help with this. Uh, and so, and of course, graduate students. And so really uh, any of the data that I'm sharing with you today would not be possible uh, without the literal dozens of students who have helped out on these projects. Okay, so I just wanna acknowledge that. For this first study, um, some questions that we had asked was one, how does Microplastic abundance vary between river habitats because we sampled surface water and benthic sediment. We predicted that there'll be more microplastics and benthic sediments because a lot of the polymers that plastics are made out of tend to be more dense than fresh water and are likely to settle and sink down um, to the sediment. And so what we're looking at here are eight river sites, the Menominee, Manistee, Muskegon, Fox, Grand, Milwaukee, Kalamazoo, and St. Joseph rivers around Lake Michigan. And we're sampling as close to the mouth of the rivers as possible. Overwhelmingly, you can see that there's more uh, microplastic in the brown bars, which represent sediment, than the blue, which is the surface water. And so I'll put some numbers up here to uh, help that because this scale is 
kind of a large and obnoxious. I think it's a pretty obnoxious number scale. But um, some of our, like a forested site, about 100,000 micro um, plastic particles. This is per cubic meter um, for volume. Uh, Milwaukee, an urban dominated watershed, about 125,000. Uh, but here, St. Joe, we estimate about 3.1 million uh, microplastic particles per cubic uh, meter of sediment. Okay. And I think I may have misspoke before. These are all volumes uh, for sediment, not water. So to kind of maybe make a connection with 3.1 million, that's a really hard number uh, for me to always connect with and uh, wrap my head around. So if we just take that St. Joe site, uh, the surface water was about 90,000 uh, particles per cubic meter of uh, water and sediment was about 3.1 million. So hypothetically, if we took above ground swimming pool, you know, that floppy kind you can probably buy from like Walmart or whatnot, it holds about 11 cubic uh, meters of water. If we were to fill up this swimming pool with water from uh, surface water from St. Joe, and you multiply that, you do the math, that swimming pool holds about a million microplastic pieces if we were to fill it up with river water from the St. Joe River. So the question is, well, how many swimming pools does it take to equal the amount of microplastics we estimate in one cubic uh, meter of sediment from the same river? You would need three swimming pools filled up with uh, surface water from the St. Joe just to equal what we find in one cubic meter of sediment. And so this is what your family is swimming in. If you've got kids, I'm sure they're drinking that water too, even though they're not supposed to, right? So that's a lot of microplastics, okay? Another question we had uh, was related to fish. You know, are fish traits like body size or trophic position, if they're more predator oriented or more herb um, herbivore or detritivore oriented, is that linked to how much microplastic we find inside their digestive tissues? We predicted that um, the bigger the fish, the more microplastics. And we also predicted that the more predator oriented the fish, the more microplastics. I'm not gonna be sharing the body size data with you today, but I can tell you that uh, this is complicated and we only have seen it in a few species, but it's not really consistent across fish. So I'm really gonna focus here on the trophic position and the abundance of microplastic inside fish for the rest of this section of our talk. So this is a list of our fish from uh, a couple of our sites. Okay, uh, we for the, some of these data here I'm going to share with you, um, there were 161 uh, fish uh, across 18 different taxa, and 93% of the fish uh, that we sampled had microplastics inside. What we're looking at here is uh, concentration, so it's number of microplastics per fish that was from their digestive tracts. Okay, and they're color coded according to uh, their functional feeding group. If they're zoobenthivore, so they're preying on invertebrates, omnivore, uh, so animals and uh, algae and detritivores. Okay, and so for example, um, the largest was the pumpkin seed sunfish that had 52 um, particles of microplastics, uh, largemouth bass, juvenile, 32 particles, round goby, which is invasive in the Great Lakes, has 21 particles. Uh, the fathead minnow had about five and the gizzard shad had about three. So overall, we do see this trend of the more predator oriented fish team seem to have more microplastics. Okay, so this suggests that maybe bioaccumulation uh, and potentially magnification up the food web of microplastics is occurring because trophic transfer from a lower trophic level to a higher trophic level might be occurring as a predator is eating its prey. Microplastic might be moving up the food web. When we uh, think about, well, how much microplastic is in rivers and in the same fish from those rivers, okay? So some of our, we'll look at number per cubic meter, this is in concentration. Uh, we saw that some of our agricultural sites for surface water had uh, really high concentrations of microplastics compared to some of our other ag and um, forested sites with Milwaukee kind of in between there for an urban. This figure is the concentration of microplastics in fish. And so we had thought that potentially that the number of microplastics in fish might re represent their habitat, the number in water. And this would be really interesting because if we could just sample the water in the river, we could predict potentially how much microplastics in the fish. 
Uh, but this was not the case. You can see here that um, these are green, so these are forested dominant watersheds, um, uh, sampling sites, and they had the most microplastic, okay, which was very different than what we saw in the surface waters. Okay, what types of plastics, polymers, were we, did we find inside the fish? Uh, uh, some really common ones like polyethylene, commonly used for like plastic bottles, toys, and those plastic shopping bags. Uh, down here, uh, polyethylene terephthalate textiles. So I'm sure probably almost everyone uh, in the audience is probably wearing some sort of uh, polyester spandex plastic clothing. Okay. Uh, and so even though visually it looks like there wasn't a pattern, I still did the statistical analysis and there was no uh, statistical uh, relationship between the amount of microplastic in the water and the amount of microplastic in fish. Okay. Um, so I was really uh, kind of a little bit puzzled by that. Um, there's lots of other avenues we have since explored um, to um, explore patterns in fish. Uh, but when I was a postdoc, I really thought there would be a pattern and this was not the case. And so I started asking, well, when did microplastics first become incorporated into aquatic food webs? Can we detect when this first happened? And so I was a little frustrated about this um, and went to go talk to my mentor at the time, uh, Dr. Tim Holine. Uh, and I said, I wish we can go back in time like Dr. Who and sample uh, different time points before plastic and when plastic was developing and in current uh, times, because maybe there used to be a relationship, but now there's just so much microplastics everywhere. It just doesn't even really matter where the fish is living. And he thought like, oh, you can use museum historical specimens. And this was a, such a simple, brilliant idea. We can't sample the water back then, but we have all these um, museum specimens that we can do a similar analysis on. So we partnered with the Field Museum in Chicago um, and uh, uh, processed a fish from 1900 to I believe 2018. Uh, and this was work was done in collaboration and eventually led by uh, master student Lauren Ho. And so we had predicted that microplastic detection would show up right around when the industry started booming. So microplastic, excuse me, plastic was first uh, really developed in 1907. Uh, and then after the 19, uh, in the 1950s, after World War II, the plastic industries boomed, okay? And so this concept of throwaway living where just use a plastic cup and throw it away so you don't have to use water to wash the cup or spend more time doing chores uh, was really successful. And I argue we still live by um, this throwaway living today. Okay, and we are consistently increasing in plastic production. And so uh, this is basically a very similar timeline here for plastics. And so we were predicted that, well, around the 1950s, we expect plastic to show up in the fish uh, timeline and that it's gonna increase through time. That's what we thought would happen. And so, yep, we found plastics inside the fish and it aligned with what we thought. So right here in uh, 1950s is when we see microplastics showing up. And for we have different, uh, different species of fish that were really abundant in the museum collection around Chicago. Um, and we can see that there's uh, an overall general increase in trend, okay? And we found um, lots of different types of anthropogenic materials such as polyester, polyethylene, Okay, some are natural based, so like cellulose, uh, cotton fibers, uh, for example. All right, and this uh, yellow right here, okay, these are the average across all fish. And we overlaid this data with the Chicago population uh, census and plastic production from that Geyer et al. 2017 paper. And visually speaking, uh, you can see that there's, um, a, you know, a pattern here as there increase in microplastics in fish on average through time. This seems to be maybe correlated with an increase in plastic production, what we're finding in other habitats and human population. So at about that time in my plastic research journey, uh, my postdoc was only for two years. It was funded by Illinois Indiana Sea Grant uh, under NOAA. I was of course looking for a job and that's how I ended up here in Bakersfield. Uh, and so when I was looking for a position, the job call was 
basically a perfect match. You couldn't almost get any perfect of a job description. And when I was looking at the area, I was not familiar with California at all. I grew up in the Poconos in Northeast Pennsylvania and New Jersey. Um, and I saw that there's a diversity of habitat types uh, and regions uh, within a close proximity, which is really interesting uh, and new to me. And also, if we uh, kind of return back here, this that little base map um, I showed you before, if you zoom in, okay, on the West Coast, there is very little, if any, plastic um, happening research inland, especially here in the Central Valley. So there's a lot of opportunities for this uh, avenue of research to explore it. And uh, during my first uh, <laughs> September, August, uh, I experienced the particulate air pollution. I had heard about it, but hadn't really known about it. I uh, experienced it myself. Okay, I um, joke with my family members that um, Californians had masks before the pandemic because of particulate air pollution. Uh, and so this really got to thinking, it's like, well, all these particulates are in the air. Uh, you know, how much microplastic is in the quote, particulate dust? How much microplastic is raining on us? Okay, and so that really led to uh, one of the first projects that we developed here in my lab at uh, CSUB. So I am not sure how familiar folks are with uh, the campus, but we have a field research station which has different types of habitats. One is an open grassland habitat. Uh, and on the south side, there's uh, forest remnants, uh, if you will. And so there's different landscape features in the uh, ESA ecological studies area uh, field research station that we could take advantage of. And so I designed an experiment pretty similar to what I had done for my PhD, where I was measuring uh, nutrient deposition for uh, rainwater. We predicted there'll be more microplastic particles in forest habitat compared to the grassland because uh, dust and other particles will build up on the leaves. And then when it rains, it can wash off and you can have a more concentration, higher concentration. So we did this very high tech, 10 foot PVC pipes, bottle attached with a funnel insert, okay? And we'd put it out there um, about 24 hours before rain and then a second set would be put out um, right before rain would happen so we can measure uh, wet, so rain and dry depth, um, dust uh, particulate settling. Okay, our uh, methods are pretty similar. We collect the water, it gets uh, digested, uh, dissolve uh, material except for the plastics, and then eventually ends up in a filter and examined under a microscope. And this project was uh, headed by one of my very first undergraduate students. She's actually graduating uh, this May, uh, Caitlin Macaranis. And so what we found, so this is her preliminary data, um, the pandemic uh, hit <laughs> and we had to uh, slowly work through samples. She's been a really rock star working on this. Okay, uh, what we're looking here is mean rainfall, the average rainfall in the grassland habitat on different dates and the forest habitat. And there was much more rain, significantly greater more rain in the open grassland than forest, which is what I expected because the plants were going to intercept and absorb some of that rainwater. We did not see the same patterns in terms of microplastics, okay, or uh, particles. So we account both microplastics and natural based anthropogenic microparticles, like, for example, cotton fibers from textiles. So overall, we saw that there was more. Um, uh, particles, uh, micro particles, anthropogenic based particles in the forest habitat compared to the grassland for total concentration. Okay. Um, and then overall deposition. So the accumulated amount that gets deposited per square meter of land. And this pattern was consistent for specifically for plastics and for the natural based anthropogenic uh, materials as well. So, like a cotton fiber, for example. And so this was really interesting because it shows that there's there could be large scale deposition both in dry and rain events across the landscape, regardless if you're in coastal or inland areas. What we're looking at here is one of the first photos I took of the Kern River back in September 8th, 2018. So I'd been here for about a month uh, and I went down to the riverbed as a river um, uh, river study person would do, a uh, freshwater ecologist studies rivers. And I noticed anthropogenic litter in the uh, bushes and shrubs right next to the river. And I also saw it in the river itself. 
Okay, and so this got me uh, pondering some other questions. Okay, I also saw some debris dams, which are um, usually consisting of leaves and woody debris uh, and tend to be a nice hotspot um, for habitat and resources for organisms in streams. And so uh, something that is really unique um, is that historically debris dams only had natural materials um, like leaves and uh, plant materials. Okay, and occasionally, you know, animal carcasses would build up in part of the debris dam. But because anthropogenic litter has been part of the environment for decades, we actually now see anthropogenic litter being uh, a really uh, important component um, contributing to the structure and size of these debris dams. So we find all sorts of materials in debris dams these days. And when we look at these materials, they are in some cases being colonized by aquatic uh, insects. So these are caddisfly cases, for example, that have attached themselves to, uh, this is a Funyun bag actually right there. So we got to asking another type of question, which is, well, what about road bridges? We build bridges over rivers. They've got piers, structural columns going into the riverbed. How does this influence the distribution of litter in rivers? Because rivers, um, usually have flow, water flowing in them. Uh, the Kern River is a lot more intermittent than it should be, okay? Uh, and so this study was taking place at the Mohawk Bridge where we collected litter above uh, and upstream and downstream, okay? And also under the Mohawk Bridge at these debris dam and near side non-debris dam locations. All of the litter was brought back to the lab. It was washed, cleaned, dried, and we measured it like the dimensions and the mass. Okay, and this is actually one of the projects, um, research projects for my master's student, uh, Amy Fetters, and she'll be defending her research this upcoming summer. What Amy found is that um, there's a lot of uh, different types of material types uh, with plastic being the most common material found in debris dams under the bridge, the plots uh, under the bridge without debris dams and upstream and downstream of the bridge. But we did see a more uh, variety um, of items downstream and upstream. In terms of you know, where are these items coming from, like their function in human society, uh, this is all anthropogenic litter across all materials and this is plastic only. Uh, overwhelmingly, we saw food and unknown. So something was classified unknown if it was too small of a material of an item that we couldn't figure out what it was. So maybe it was like a fragment, for example. So food anthropogenic litter was by far the most abundant across all the sampling sites. In terms of the overall abundance and density, we found that there was a lot more um, litter uh, in debris dams under the bridge compared to our other sites. And so this kind of, you know, helps us uh, figure out that, well, if you're gonna, you know, do a litter river cleanup, uh, targeting areas with lots of debris dams is gonna be really worth your effort because those debris dams are just, they're like these big necks capturing a lot of this litter, anthropogenic litter. Um, and so you can just really, um, you know, put your target efforts there. Something else that we found um, was that debris dams tended to have more of these flexible items. So like a plastic bag that could easily wrap around a, a twig, as opposed to rigid, like um, a bottle that might just like hit the debris dam and then bounce off and carry on downstream. Okay, kind of like what we see here, all right. And so overall for this specific study here, we saw that um, there's uh, lots of litter that will accumulate under the bridge. And so the bridge with these debris dams uh, seems to be capturing litter. Uh, and this can be really uh, useful information when it comes to management practices. And so we're still left with uh, you know, lots of unanswered questions, such as what is the fate of anthropogenic litter in the environment? And we saw organisms are colonizing, aquatic insects were colonizing the litter. And so this kind of led to another project, um, which is, well, what kind of environmental conditions impact the breakdown, the degradation of plastics in the environment? 
So if we return back here to the ESA, this grassland habitat, um, we uh, did a study out there and uh, the same study uh, nearby on campus, we have this uh, vernal pool pond on campus uh, where we added plastics and tree leaves to see, well, how, how do, are they gonna decompose differently or similarly in the different habitats? And we predicted that in the pond, plastics uh, were not going to degrade, but in the grassland, they would because of high heat, uh, temperature heat and UV exposure. They would become more brittle and fragment in the grassland. We expected that tree leaves were decomposed faster in ponds uh, compared to the grassland habitat. And we made uh, leaf pack nettings that had a mixture of both um, plastic and tree leaves because in the environment in the river you find leaf packs are a mixture of different types of materials, not just usually one species of leaf. So we made about 300 of these leaf packs anchored in the stream and they were harvested monthly over the course of a year. Um, we have some preliminary data to share with you. Uh, oops, forgot about those. Uh, so we used platanus leaves um, that were collected here from campus. Uh, and so visually after the leaf packs were collected, uh, they were picked and sorted to separate the material so we can weigh it and then measure change in mass through time. And this is another project um, led by my master's student, Amy Fetters. And so visually speaking in the aquatic habitat, um, the plastic didn't really look like it changed, uh, but we did see some visible mass loss for the tree leaves. In the terrestrial habitat, the tree leaves seemed to have not lost mass and the plastics really did become more brittle and start fragmenting into uh, smaller pieces. The ones exposed on the surface, the on the underside, they tend to be uh, intact for a period of time. What we're looking at here are um, the trend lines for the different treatments. Blue is the pond, green is the grassland but I'm gonna put these little leaf packs there. So this steep dark line here, okay, this is um, the breakdown was fastest with tree leaves in the pond and was slowest in the pond with the plastic. Basically plastic didn't break down. And in between was mixed. This is actually exactly what we predicted would happen in the pond. For the grassland habitat, plastic, um, uh, let's see here, plastic, uh, broke down a little bit. You can see a trend line. Uh, it's starting to go down through here. Okay, with uh, the tree leaves, uh, the line is uh, not as steep. It's a little hard to see, um, but it's actually in parallel. The rate is the same as the mixed. Okay, uh, and so there's some breakdown happening, uh, but this is at about, I think, eight months. Uh, and so this is right before the first rain event happened in October. And so we actually have a few more months where we can see, I expect these lines are gonna be, uh, for the plastic terrestrial line is gonna be much steeper once we put the um, rest of the data in there. Cause by the end of the experiment, uh, there really wasn't much left, okay? So for example, uh, tree leaves were up to three and a half times faster compared to plastic in ponds and we're about one and a half times slower compared to plastic in the grassland. And so uh, there are some other developing projects that I do not have time to share with you today, uh, but just to give you a little uh, lens through our ongoing developing projects, um, studying microplastics in California waterways, um, looking at geographical and historical patterns on larger scales for fish and other animals. I'm really interested in using these uh, more uh, museum collections, as well as partnering with other groups across the country. Um, there's uh, been study, I literally have raw wastewater sewage in my refrigerator in my lab right now. So we're looking at wastewater, uh, as well as terrestrial animals too. Um, so we've been collecting scat from the kit boxes here on campus and owl pellets and kind of looking at maybe what kind of meso and microplastics uh, might be passing through uh, their digestive systems, which could eventually end up in waterways. And so <clears throat> ultimately overall, if we understand how environmental conditions change, we can start to understand connections between terrestrial aquatic uh, systems, and we can understand how this could influence the abundance and distribution and potential fate of anthropogenic litter and plastics in the environment. And so this helps us understand what might become a resource 
uh, for some organisms or might become harmful, um, like maybe wounded animal, for example. And so we can apply these relationships across different uh, scales from local, regional, uh, national scales, from terrestrial to marine, terrestrial uh, freshwater, freshwater to marine. And this all helps us to understand uh, how ethnic activities and management activities across the landscape can really help change these connections, okay, when we're trying to manage for this type of pollution in the environment. Um, a lot of times folks ask what's being done about plastic pollution. There's a lot of organizations, organizations working to reduce and support research. A lot of countries have started banning different types of single use plastics uh, and promoting single um, sustainable alternatives. Uh, myself and my master's students, part of the team of put together for California uh, to that has been studying and developing standard operating procedures to regulate and monitor microplastics in the drinking water. And so there's lots of ways use as an, you as an individual, you can uh, replace single use uh, with uh, repeat use. So choose uh, paper instead of plastic, okay? Uh, reuse, reusable thermos, bring your own uh, bags when you go shopping. Uh, these are photos of items I use uh, all the time. I really like this tiny panda uh, bamboo travel set. Uh, these food huggers, I use these all of the time. I have switched from uh, regular toothpaste to those toothpaste tablets. Um, I really like, actually do feel like my teeth are a little bit cleaner using this. I use the biodegradable bamboo toothbrush. Okay, so these are some items that, you know, swap them out periodically over time. Um, and it's, uh, they're pretty cheap overall, uh, and they outlast for a while. Okay, so just be mindful of the products that you use, stay educated on the issue, and there's also uh, uh, volunteer litter cleanups. Okay, so um, uh, my master's student attended on um, the last one, uh, Bring Back the Current Did, but they, I think they have another one uh, in a couple weekends here on April 30th. And so spread the word. So with that, I'd like to thank all the students, my mentors, funding agencies, uh, and collaborators. And uh, with that, I think there should be time, hopefully, for some questions. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Bray. That was amazing and so very informative. I do have some questions here. Um, we'll go ahead and take a couple, but there's some good ones. Let me go ahead and ask. Um, so the first one is, do microplastics cause cancer? So as I mentioned before, there is almost essentially little to no research on the health implications of microplastics. It's a very understudied field. There are concerns uh, in terms that plastics do adsorb uh, persistent organic pollutants. They tend to stick to plastics because uh, they don't want to be in water. Uh, and when there have been some studies with invertebrates where if you they consume the plastics with those persistent organic pollutants, those pollutants can detach from plastics and actually are measurable in the animal's uh, hemoglobin and their body fluids and tissues. So there's potential for plastics to transfer pollutants to human tissues as well. Um, so I can't really speak uh, confidently on the uh, cancer, uh, but because there's really not much research, but uh, that's an area of uh, interest. And there are a lot of folks that are um, trying to figure out how to study that. Thank you. Um, and then we'll take a couple more questions. Um, another one here is, are microplastics a geologic or archaeologic strata marker? <laughs> Yeah, that's actually uh, um, on Twitter uh, a few years ago, there was this like a uh, photo where it had uh, how future archeologists like uh, hundreds of years from now will excavate humans and they'll know they found like the plastic boom because we'll be like plastics in us and around us. And so um, there's, you know, been to some discussion about, um, you know, the Anthropocene uh, with, you know, if that should be like an actual, um, new uh, section in the geologic time. Uh, and, you know, a lot of times I hear folks talk about, you know, the presence of plastics, because it's, uh, you do see it, like sometimes a, 
uh, and layers of sand dunes. You see it there um, as it becomes more exposed, uh, erosion is happening, uh, plastics are being exposed. Um, and so I think it's a really interesting question. Um, I'm not a geologist, but um, I do hear people kind of talk about that, you know, maybe plastics um, is some sort of marker showing human impact across the planet um, that could potentially be a line of argument for um, the quote Anthropocene. Thank you for that. Um, one more question. What happens to the waste when they transport into the marine estuaries and coastal habitats? So what kind of waste are we talking about? Are we talking about like wastewater, like human waste from wastewater to the plants? Or are we talking about like anthropogenic, anthropogenic litter waste um, that makes its way Plastics. Um, plastics. Yes. So plastics uh, persist, uh, have been estimated to persist in the environment um, for depending on the polymer type and the structure of the item um, for hundreds of years is what's expected. So for example, like a plastic bag uh, could potentially last for 20 years before it might uh, degrade further. Um, or in some uh, items, they expected for hundreds of years. So in the marine environment, I mean, uh, the water is colder than the terrestrial environment, right? Um, and so you some buffering uh, for temperature. So higher temperatures with higher, uh, warmer waters increases decomposition. But a lot of times when we think about plastics, it's more like degradation because uh, it's hard to measure biological decomposition of plastics. So usually what happens is you have like a big plastic item, for example, this is a reusable uh, water bottle, uh, but if it got lost, it went down the river, it was at Tohon Ranch Conservancy uh, <laughs> just until about an hour and a half ago, okay? Uh, over time, it would get brittle and fragment and it would be go from a macro to a mesoplastic particles and then from meso to micro and from micro to nano. Uh, and then eventually potentially maybe biologically broken down into its, uh, um, chemical constituents. So that has a very long time scale for um, what's been estimated. I'm not really sure if I answered the question uh, very well or not. Thank you so much, Ray. Um, so I do have one more question and then we can go ahead and wrap things up. Um, Greg wants to know how effective and costly are techniques to collect marine plastics in the garbage patches? How costly? How effective? Oh, man, I wish we had Captain Moore on call. He could answer that question. Um, I mean, so depending on, I mean, I see like some folks, so when I, I haven't sampled the ocean myself, but I have sampled the Great Lakes like out on a boat on the lakes and they're just, in, they're inland seas. And a lot of times we use like a manta trawl, okay, hooked up to the boat, uh, and that will uh, capture quite a bit of material. Uh, and so uh, these, uh, you know, uh, nets, uh, manta trawls, plankton nets are oftentimes used. And so depending on the size you want, they can get pricey or they can get something uh, maybe for like a hundred bucks or so, uh, depending again on the size that you want. Uh, and then you just bring that on board. And if you have like a sieve to kind of separate the water and then uh, from the material and then put it in a bottle, okay? Uh, and you have your material there. So barring getting out to the Pacific Ocean patch and getting the manta trawl, um, the process itself is relatively easy if you're just hoping to collect some. But it's also really easy to do here in a lot of the lakes um, that are local as well. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Dr. McNeish, for your time today and for sharing your knowledge with us. The museum would love to have you back here again soon. And before we go, I just want to mention one more time that if you enjoyed today's event, please consider making a donation to BuenaVistaMuseum.org slash donation. Your generosity is what makes events like this possible. Thanks again, everyone, for coming, and please keep an eye on our website for the next Meet the Expert event and other events like this. Thank you all. Have a great night.
Bye.